Hallelujah. Father, we magnify you today. Lord Jesus, we magnify you today. God, we exalt your name this day. Father, I believe the spirit of expectancy is in the house of God today. God, we believe that you can and you will accomplish, therefore, what you have desired today. Oh, God, that your government would be in this place today. Father, we cry out, we but magnify you. God, for the darkness that has been removed, the light now that I have received, uh, nothing but the grace of the Most High. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, church. He's worthy today. God, you are to be magnified. My God, you are to be exalted today. My God, you are to be magnified in the house today. I lift up my voice. I lift up my desires unto thee, O God. Be exalted, O Lord, I pray. Thy will, thy kingdom come this day in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 The sound of heaven touching earth. Hallelujah. The sound of heaven touching earth. Our Father. Come on. Can you lift him up? Can that be your prayer today? Oh, have your way in this place. Oh, I lift my voice. I lift my voice to you, Jesus. Oh, have your way. Have your way, Jesus. Sound of heaven touching us, our Father. How do it be thy name? Oh, let your will be done, Lord. Have your way. Let your kingdom come, Lord. Hallelujah. I lift my praise. I lift my adoration to you, Lord.
you lift your voice to heaven. Lord, let your will be done. God, as you reign as the king of my life, God, as you reign on the throne of my heart, have your way. Let your glory be manifested in this place. Let your very presence come. Let it change us. Let it touch us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If that's your prayer, can you lift your hands to heaven? Come on. We need you, Jesus, right now. We need your presence. We need your very touch in this place. Hallelujah. We give our hearts to you. I surrender my mind to you. Let your will be done in the name of Jesus. Mm, Can you sing this? There is nothing like the presence of the Lord. Can you just lift your hands to heaven? There is nothing like the presence of the Lord. As we seek your face, and as we seek his face, he is here in this place. There is nothing like the presence of the Lord. There is nothing like the presence of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. There is nothing like the presence of the Lord. Oh, yes. And as we seek His face, He is here in this place. There is nothing like the presence of the Lord. Come on, there is freedom. of the Lord. Oh, yes, there is. There is freedom in the presence of the Lord. And as we seek His face, He is here in His place. There is freedom in the presence of the Lord. Sing that again. There is freedom in the presence of 
entertain his presence today. God, we worship you. We yield ourselves to you, Father. We invite you. Come into this place, God. Come into this place, into each and every one of us, Lord, and have your way today. I pray you would speak a word of faith, God, a word of encouragement. Whatever we have need of, God, it's in your presence today. Let us receive it by faith. In the name of Jesus, everyone said amen. Amen. God bless you. You make, can make your way back to your seats. I shared with the adult class a statement today from Charles Spurgeon. He says that little faith will take our souls to heaven, but great faith will bring heaven to our souls. And I believe that's what we're here today gathered for is to let heaven touch earth once again get a fresh touch of the Holy Ghost in this place whatever you need see we sometimes think this is what I need and God says no that's not what you need this is what you need trust me God's plans God's vision God's hands they're so much bigger than ours and I want to trust his plan I want him to give me what he desires me to have I was just praying I believe it was last night or 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 Friday and telling the Lord, God, I want to learn to be more content. The scripture says, be content with such things as you have. And if it, we're not careful, we can get caught up in this world, the advertising and telling you, you just need another thing. If you have this thing right here, you're going to find contentment. Can I tell you, contentment is only found in one place. It's in the presence of the Lord and allowing that presence, hallelujah, to fill this place. And that's our desire today. God move in this place personally upon each and every one of us. We're going to invite the ushers to come wait on us for our tithe and offering today. As they come, just a reminder to our men that are going to men's conference and oh, we've got a wonderful group going. 30 plus guys that are going to be going to men's conference. It's going to be a wonderful time. Next Friday, we're going to meet here at the church at noon for lunch. And uh, around 1 or 1.30, we'll load up in the vehicles and begin to head south towards the conference. But just a reminder, today the monies are due for that if you'd see Brother Steve Carter uh, before you leave today. Also, today is the last chance to sign up for Linda Lou's lasagna dinner. Uh, our own sister Linda Smith is a wonderful cook, has been so hospitable to so many of us. If you've been around their home, you know that's good eating right there. And uh, she is sponsoring a fundraiser for our school, New Life Christian Academy, next Sunday. And there's a sign-up sheet in the fellowship hall. Uh, and today is the last day to sign up for that. Unfortunately, because of our limited space, the dining room is already full, but they will be doing carry-out. So if you want a quick meal that is economical, very tasty, and will be a blessing to the kingdom of God, stop by and sign up today, and I promise you it will be a blessing. Father, we thank you today for your sweet presence. Thank you for bringing us all together, Lord, in this place and just bathing us in your presence. I pray that you would continue to flow and move among us as we lift our praise to you. God, as we give to you, I pray that you would bless the gift and the giver and we'll give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen.
and all that is within me, I praise your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise your name, praise your name. Hallelujah. 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 My God. Something that begins to happen in the atmosphere when we begin to praise and magnify Jesus. Because if you're like me, you come to church with stuff, issues in our mind. But when you enter into praise and worship, you begin to magnify him bigger than the problem. Ha. And so they begin to praise, and the Lord sent ambushments against the enemy. So they begin to sing praises and the earth began to shake. The angels simply begin to praise and the doorposts were moved. Why? Because praise denotes faith. You don't praise something you don't believe in. feel it in the house today. And praise and worship opens our spirit so that God can move. It wasn't their praise and worship that defeated the enemy. It was their praise and worship that got God's attention. God defeated the enemy. What praise and worship that loosened the bands on Paul and Silas? Praise and worship contact the Holy Spirit. So whenever we enter into a series of praise and worship like we have today, what we do is summons, as it were. I know he's, or two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. But when we begin to praise and worship God, it just creates an atmosphere. God just shows up and shows out. And we've done just that. We have created an atmosphere of praise and worship. I'm telling you. How you feel, Sister Terry? <laughs> I know she don't have any oxygen on today. God's good. <laughs> praise God. Before I took that job with you, I asked him. She's the reason I went to drive a bus. Her and her precious mother, praise God. Amen. I'm here ready to hear the word of the Lord. I am too, amen. Well, if you could make your way back to your seats. We're so blessed today that uh, Brother and Sister Ellis are with us. 
He's been here on numerous occasions. She's been here, I think, a couple times, maybe. Um, but we're so fortunate to have Sister Ellis with us today. And um, I asked her how she deals with him traveling all over the country. She said, I go with him. And so she's here with him today. Actually, not over the country, all over the world. And uh, what an amazing woman of God. What an amazing woman of God. Sister Ellis, if you would come, your husband told me to ask you to come before I ask him. Would you give this wonderful lady a hand clap of appreciation? We love her. Ashley family, and you have great leadership here that you can trust. They're people of integrity. What I feel to talk about, I have three scriptures that I want to read. And uh, the first one is in Psalms 109 and uh, verse number 21. It says, But do thou for me, O God, the Lord, for thy name's sake, because thy mercy is good, deliver thou me. For I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded in me. The next scripture I want to read is in Isaiah uh, 1 and verse number 5. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the feet, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. And then I want to read in verse Isaiah uh, chapter 53 and verse number 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Yet we did a stick in him, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. And what I want to talk to you about this morning is wounds. I, because of our travels, and we have traveled now many years, um, I have still been able to keep a cat. And I have this cat that um, was a rescue cat. And when I first brought the rescue cat home, I started out in the basement because it didn't know the house. And it would literally walk against the wall. I mean literally. As far as it could get away from me, it would walk against the wall. And then I decided, okay, I'm just going to sit on the floor with some cat food. And I just sat there and sat there and sat there. And I thought, you're going to get hungry. And so finally, it would come to me. And little by little, it has given itself to me. And it's beginning to be a lap cat. And I have, I know we have all had wounds in our lives at one time or another. But the reason that this cat was like it was was because it was wounded. They had to take it to an emergency place to have its wounds closed up. So any movement that I made, it would immediately draw back. Just, just, it was just an, a reaction that it had. And I feel like many times we have wounds, and if we're not careful, and if we don't allow God to take care of these wounds, these wounds will continue to fester in us. And Jesus has his hand out to us. He understands wounds. He understands bruises. And he has his hand out to us. But when something happens, we immediately want to back up instead of drawing closer to him. And I just want to encourage you this morning to allow God to heal whatever that bruise is, whatever that wound is. Whatever that hurt is, don't back up, but allow him to heal that wound and heal it completely that it does not come up and fester again in your life. God bless you.
great word. Great word. <clears throat> it's great to be here to me. And uh, <clears throat> uh, there's a very <laughs> special touch of God in the house. Amen. And uh, <clears throat> I was... I was really hoping, I actually thought this morning, so, well, you know, when I was here before, the choir always sang on Sunday night. And uh, I wonder if the choir is going to sing today because I love this choir. Sister Adina, you do an incredible job. Where are you at? Okay, you did, there you are. An incredible job. All the, the, entire, the entire team, the entire team is incredible. Would you give them a hand? I say that because one of the things that I appreciate so much about what I've experienced this morning and even Wednesday evening was there was no sense of show or entertainment. They were all engaged in worship. And they were leading us into the presence of God. And uh, God knows we've got a lot of entertainers in our world today. But uh, I just want to thank them, the entire team, for their atmosphere or for their attitude of worship and praise that it's so easy to, to, to not just respond but to just worship with them. You didn't, you didn't feel like you were obligated to watch them perform. You ever been in that situation where you just felt like you were obligated to watch the performers? Thank God that was not what we experienced today. And uh, <clears throat> again, I so commend the leadership of this church. Certainly your pastor, his wife, the entire pastoral team, uh, your founding bishop, all that, that family, this family, and all of you that are part of the team here have have given and made available so that this place can be a special place to give honor and glory to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. I, uh, <clears throat> it, it, th this would be a very easy service to just turn loose, just let go. And, uh, and no doubt we would see... Uh, Many things happen today. And I believe we're going to before it's over. But the greater work that I believe God has to, or God is wanting to do today, is not just externally, not something that we will visibly see today, but what will take place internally that will enable you to be who God is calling you to be as you move forward into the future. If you have your Bibles, I would like you to turn with me to the book of Ezekiel. <clears throat> uh, Ezekiel chapter 43. Begin reading at verse number one. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east. And behold, the glory of the Lord, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters and the earth shined with his glory how many want the glory of God we want to see his glory manifested and it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw even according to the vision 
that I saw when I came to destroy the city and the visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Chebar and I fell on my face. And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate whose prospect is toward the east. So the spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court and behold the glory of the Lord filled the house and I heard him speaking unto me out of the house and the man stood by me drop down to verse 10 just for sake of time thou son of man show the house to the house of Israel show the house to the house of Israel that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. And if they be ashamed of all that they have done, show them the form of the house and the fashion thereof and the goings out thereof and the comings in thereof and all the forms thereof and all the ordinances thereof and all the forms thereof and all the laws thereof and write it in their sight that they may keep the whole form thereof and all the ordinance thereof and do them. Everybody say, do them. them. Notice this, please. This is the law of the house. Upon the top of the mountain, the whole limit thereof round about all shall be most Holy, behold, this is the law of the house. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Begin reading at verse number 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient, not wise. All things are lawful for me, But I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication. But for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his own power. Know ye not? that your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know you not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's or which belong to God. I'm taking my subject this morning or this afternoon from Ezekiel chapter 43 verse number five, or verse number, uh, I'm sorry, verse number 12. This is the law of the house upon the top of the mountains. The whole limit thereof round about shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. Preaching to you today on this subject, holiness The law of God's house. Holiness. 
the law of God's house. I sense that title shocks some of you. Will you lay your Bibles down? Will you lift your hands to the Lord? We have worship, we have praise. Do we want the word? Father, in your name, and into your hands, we commend our spirit to be used as your oracle today. You know why you have chosen this message today for this moment in time to this local body. You know, Lord God. Now, we are not debating you. We're not questioning you. We are trusting you. We ask you now to help us say the things that matter. And Lord, as Sister Ellis has already reached out to these precious people, if there's any wounded in this house today, help them understand that the Lord of the house wants to touch their wounds. In Jesus' name, I'm asking you, Lord, to let the things that matter be said here this moment in time. In Jesus' name. Will you clap your hands to the Lord? Will you shout to God with a voice of triumph? For he alone is worthy. Praise God. Praise God. In the name of the Lord. 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 God bless you, and you may be seated. Thank you for standing so long. Two Sunday mornings ago at home in Canton, Pastor Foster was led by God to preach a very sobering message that was a warning. A warning to no doubt many in the house about how careless they were living. Right after he finished came over to me and he asked me if I would be willing to preach the Sunday evening service. As I was walking to my study, which is right off the platform, I felt the Lord say to me that I was simply to pick up where he left off. I didn't really understand all that meant, but I got my things, I gathered up, my wife and I drove home, And I went into my office or my study at home and almost immediately as I walked into that study, the Lord began to speak to me very, very clearly. And uh, I had no plans or thoughts about preaching that that message uh, beyond that Sunday night service. Um... The next Sunday, which was last Sunday, we were in Upper Sandusky. It's where we came before we came here again. Had no plans to preach this message. And I was actually just standing and worshiping as I was getting ready to preach in the morning. And as I was standing there worshiping, the Lord spoke to me that I was to preach that message that Sunday night. And I was, I couldn't hardly keep my mind on the morning message because I felt the urgency of the message I was to preach that Sunday. And I I said to the congregation that Sunday morning, I said, if you consider yourself a member of this congregation or you even think you're going to be, I'm appealing to you, be in the house tonight. We came here. I had no plans to preach this message this morning. I had no plans at all to do it. And even Bishop asked me last night, 
we, I just shared with him. I said, what are you preaching today? And then he told me, and then he said, what are you preaching? I said, I'm not sure yet. Because I wasn't. But I couldn't get it off of my heart. In fact, it's been on my heart since I got here. And I felt without question the Lord spoke to me that I was not only to preach this message here today, but that this was a message that he gave me to the body of Christ and that everywhere I went, I was to preach this message until he told me otherwise. So I stand here today, I'm a little bit nervous, not nervous because I'm nervous about preaching. I just feel the weight of the message and I feel the seriousness of the message. And the atmosphere that we have felt in this house uh, is, is really right. It's really right. Because I've never ceased to see it fail that any time God's holiness was going to be addressed and going to be lifted up, that God meets us in a very special way. You'd have to be twice dead and plucked up by the roots not to recognize a holy God in the house today. Will you just one more time lift your hands to the Lord? Will you open your heart and allow the Lord to speak to you? Come on, don't turn off my title. Don't resist the word today. Don't think you know what I'm going to say or where I'm going to go. In Jesus' name, help us today. Help us today. Help us today. This message is a message of warning. However, not because he's a God of judgment and he's just trying to create fear in the people to make them live for him. Just the opposite is true. He's a God of love and he doesn't want to see any of us self-destruct because of bad choices. Why do I say that? give you a little story several years ago my mother was very sick I was actually in Netherlands my wife and I were sitting in Netherlands we had already bought tickets we were on our way to Israel we were going to I was scheduled to preach in Jerusalem and also in Tel Aviv and then was going into Jordan and was scheduled to be there for about four to six weeks. And uh, as we were packing our things and getting ready to go the next day, I got a call that my mother had had to go into surgery and it was a very urgent situation. And uh, feeling the need, I thought, is this just a trick to keep me from Israel? And I called my bishop and he said, Brother Ellis, if you don't get home, she's going to die. My wife and I went home. We went straight from the airport to the hospital. And she went through the surgery fine. The problem was she wasn't coming out of her anesthetic. And so my wife and I stayed in that room all night, praying all night. We took turns, literally prayed all night for my mother to recover. Somewhere during the middle of the night, probably three or four in the morning, I went down to the cafeteria just to grab some refreshments, some drink. My wife continued to pray. And I, I don't know, I would just, there was just a few people in there. There was a little group of people actually sitting around a table, a half a dozen people. And you could tell they were engaged in quite a conversation. And as they were talking... They saw me walk in and <clears throat> one of them got up and said, asked me what I was doing in the cafeteria so late at night and I expressed to them and the situation and he, he looked at me and said, are you a minister? I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I am. And he just looked at me and he said, can I ask you a question? I said, yes, sir. He said in five words, what do you think is the most important revelation that the church needs today? I tell you truth before God. The words 
came out of my mouth faster than I could think them. And what I said shocked me. I didn't anticipate it. You know, you think of Revelation, oneness of God, new birth, you know, on and on and on. And before I could even think what I was saying, the Holy Ghost spoke through, through me and said these words. The most important revelation the church needs today is the revelation of the holiness of God. And as I stood there, before I could even consummate what was just said, he went on and he said, here's the reason why. Because when you don't understand the importance of holiness, you will live your life carelessly. Can we just receive that for a moment? In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So I say to you today, a life of holiness is not a holy suggestion. It's a holy commandment. Because God knew that if we did not have the foundation of holiness governing our lives, we would self-destruct. And I will say to you at the beginning, and then I'm going to walk you through Scripture, but I want us to first understand holiness is not a bad word. We don't have to be ashamed of it. It's not a word that just came from the generation past. Holiness is in fact the law of God's house. And if you think I'm talking about just this building, not so. It's the law of God's house. Anybody here filled with the Holy Ghost? Anybody in here understand that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? If holiness is not governing your life, you will self-destruct. Leviticus 11.45. Leviticus 11.45. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt. To be your God, you shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Leviticus 19 and 2. Speak unto all the congregations of the children of Israel. And say unto them, you shall be holy, for I the Lord your God am holy. Leviticus 20 and 7, sanctify yourselves therefore and be holy for I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 20 and 26, and you shall be holy unto me for I the Lord am holy and have severed you from other people that you should be mine. But Bishop, every scripture you've read is Old Testament. That's an old covenant. Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I'm going to go to the new covenant now. First Peter chapter 1 in verse 13 through 16, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Now let me just give you a little 
little word study here. The word conversation there is an old English word. It doesn't mean the same thing that we think of it today. Paul is not saying here in all manner of how you speak. The actual Greek word here means in all manner of conduct or lifestyle. I got a question for you. What does all exclude? I want to read that one more time. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conduct and lifestyle. In all. What does all exclude? What part of your life does all exclude? Verse 16. Because, he's continuing here, it is written. So what we understand is that holiness was not just an Old Testament law. It was not a ceremonial law. But it was a divine principle. It was a fundamental principle that's as real today as it was when God first spoke it. Because Peter said, the apostle Peter said, the same, the, the same apostle that wrote Acts 2.38, or that spoke Acts 2.38, rather. Same one. Same one that stood up in, in, on the day of Pentecost and said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises to you and to your children and to those who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. None of us fuss with that. None of us. We go to the waters of baptism in Jesus' name. We receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We've spoke with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. The same apostle that preached that under divine unction spoke this by divine unction. That in every aspect of our lives, in all manner of conduct and lifestyle, because it is written, Be ye holy. For I am holy. You see, this was, this not only was the law of God's in reference to the physical building called the tabernacle and then later the temple. It was also the law of the spiritual house, which is his body, the church, which we are. Paul said it so clearly to the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians 6.19. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not of your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, externally and internally, which are God's or which belong to God. And then later in Paul's second epistle to the Corinthian church, he reminded them of how blessed they were to be called a son and a daughter of God. He also instructed them that because of the promises that they were given, that their lifestyle and their conduct should express it. That's just a little piece here. Look at 2 Corinthians 6, verse 6 through 16 through 18. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Interesting. Okay, look at this. I will dwell in them, I will walk in them. And, the, and, and be their God, and they shall be my people. Let's read it again. 
Let's read it again. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. Anybody got the Holy Ghost here today? I walk in them. Remember I told you the other day, we don't come to church, we are the church. Even heard pastors say, when I come to church, I wanted to correct him, but I didn't. Just kidding. We are the church. We are the church. I'll dwell in them, he said. I'll walk in them. I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Doesn't stop there, though. I want you to understand, these are promises that are conditional. Watch. Wherefore, or because of what I just said, come out from among them and be you separate. He didn't say be isolated. It's a difference in isolation and separation. Separation is the oldest doctrine of the Bible, but we've never been commanded to be isolated. Quite frankly, that's the problem with the Jews today. They live in isolation. I don't mean as a nation, but I mean as Judaism. How many times have you ever seen someone who is a Jew try to convert you to be a Jew? A Messianic Jews will convert you to become follower of Christ. But Jews don't try to convert Jews. I was talking to Pastor and Jonathan right after, or John Mark right after the lesson this morning. I said, do you realize that, that the first 10 years of the first century church, there was no Gentile converted? Because they were still struggling with, with this isolation mentality. When God gave them that Abrahamic promise, he said to them, through you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. They didn't understand what he meant. Now, I'm not going into that realm today. I'm just simply trying to make a point here. He said, come out from among them and be ye not isolated but separated, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. Notice he didn't define that. There are some things the Holy Ghost will teach us. And I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Notice the promises were conditional. And then he said, continuing on, I know we have chapter and verse, and we think there's a break. There isn't a break. It's continuing. Paul said, having therefore, chapter 7, verse 1, having therefore these promises, anytime you see a therefore or a wherefore, you look back into the preceding verses and find out what the therefore is there for. Having therefore these promises Dearly beloved, let us, everybody say us, Us. cleanse ourselves. Here's this word all again. From all, everybody say all. All. What does that exclude? From all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. There it is again. Externally, internally. Then he says this perfecting holiness. Doesn't sound like something that they wanted to go away, but they wanted wanted it to mature and become something even greater. Let me tell you something. If If the only level of holiness you know is the few do's and don'ts that you've learned, I feel sorry for you. There are some things that God will never do for you. You have got to do them yourself through the Spirit. He will help you. He will enable you. And see, here's the deal. We we have been told that stuff doesn't matter anymore. It's just culture. It's just Old Testament. 
and we just ignore everything. I beg to differ with you. We don't ignore everything. We need to perfect holiness. There ought to be something on the inside of us that wants to mature in our understanding of what it means to be holy before God. You see the word perfect there. Perfecting. It's not without any flaw. It actually is the word that means to mature. We are to grow. We are to mature. There should be something in us because we've been given promises. We have the privilege of being a son and a daughter of God. And that privilege puts some responsibility on me. Not, not, not because I'm being forced, but because I'm so appreciative. Look, I know where I used to be. You don't have to tell me what I was. I know where I've come from. I know what God has done in my life. But can I say it to you? That may have had a moment and an event in your time, but I promise you, you had to go back to that altar again and again and again and again why because I don't ever want to lose the importance of what it means to recognize he's holy and that same responsibility is on me because we have been filled with a holy spirit come on lift our hands and pray right now Come on, will you pray with me? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh, shalabakuya mandaya. Oh, God. Can I preach today for just a few more moments on behalf of Pastor Lashley? Can I tell you that as a pastor, you get no enjoyment out of preaching messages or teaching Bible classes that you know may cause people to walk from the church simply because they are unwilling to make changes in their lifestyle that they are living. You just got quiet on me. But I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying right here. I know I'm in the Holy Ghost today. This is especially true when you know some of those people that you're preaching and teaching to have been in church many years but have now become involved in a lifestyle that only by the grace of God will they ever come out of. At one time when they were fresh and new, laid some stuff on the altar, but have began to pick it back up. And they don't feel that same conviction, that same stirring that they once did. You, you, you know, it's, it's not because you heard something preached, it's just because God began to deal with you and, and they come and they, they say, you know, it's, it's amazing how young, young, young in the Lord and babes in Christ will, will come and pastor, is this okay? Is, is this right? Is this, and they're, they're, they're so hungry. You know why discipleship Classes and training are so important. Because any church that does not have a threshing floor is not a church. Everything that comes out of the field that helped produce the crop is not able to be ground up as grain. Isn't that right? 
can't. It can't mix with the oil and become bread that can feed a world. And so there is this threshing process because the, the chaff has to be broken and the wind has to blow and, 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 and the true grain falls to the floor and, the, and that which is chaff is blowed off away. That's the natural process. But the Spirit does the same thing. There is a Holy Ghost and fire. Oh, we love the Holy Ghost part. We love the Spirit part. It's the fire element that we're most concerned about because the fire element has a way to reveal. You see, you take, you take the purest elements, gold, silver, copper. You put the fire to it. And everything that's impure will rise to the top. That's why it's important. They say that the purest gold and the purest silver, it's, it's, it's flexible. Because all the impurities that hardens it is taken out. God, when he fills us with his spirit, there is a fire element that begins to burn and it begins to reveal and it brings to the top and it brings to our understanding things that need to be cleaned from our lives so that we can really truly be what can feed a world. Come on, lift your hands for a moment. Some of you are struggling right now. You're worried about where I'm going. Come on. Come on. Let's talk to the Lord. Will you open your heart? Don't just look at me. Come on, open your heart. Do we really want God's word today? Do we really want God's word? Oh, God, help us. Help us. Help us. Help us. know what it is pastor to be in that place where you've got to say things you really don't want to say you you have no idea the pressure that is on a pastor you have no idea because we love people and we want to be loved and we won't we don't want to we don't want to say things that may cause somebody to walk. A true pastor that loves his people never loves his people based on what he sees. He loves his people unconditionally. But that doesn't remove his responsibility to tell you the truth. See, when God places his high and holy calling on your life and calls you to preach his gospel, you don't preach because you yourself have been perfect. You preach because you know if God's love and God's mercy could reach to you and change your life, then God's love can reach anyone. I tell you in the fear of God today, there are people in this room right now who have accepted lies that you have been told. And because of those lies, you have started looking in the wrong direction. What lies, Bishop? What lies are you talking about? That you can't change. That nothing in your life will ever be different. That that secret sin and that weakness in your life that you struggle with daily it's just the way 
you are. And nothing will ever change. And because of it, even though you attend every service and put on your Sunday best, down deep, you feel trapped, you feel wounded, you feel hopeless. And if the truth was known, you don't believe you will ever be saved. And you see, when people feel hopeless, you begin looking and going in a direction that you never dreamed you'd ever go. You know, Lot, the Bible says, he pitched his tent toward Sodom. That was the direction he was looking. That was where he set his eyes. And it was only a matter of time until he took his family there. Knowing that the lifestyle he was going into was godless. Knowing everything that city represented. And the consequences of that single decision caused the destruction of his entire family. Say, oh, oh, no, Bishop, his two daughters came out okay. Oh, really? Did they really come out okay? The Bible says that right after they came out, they had an ancestral relationship with their father, both of them. And from that offspring rose up two of the most wicked nations that ever existed on the face of the earth and they became arch enemies to Israel and God's people and everything God represented. Don't be fooled. Decisions matter. Consequences always come from decisions. I've said this numbers of times. I'm quite sure I've said this here at some point. You know, there used to be taught that if it's the will of God, it's going to happen. Bless God, it's going to happen. If it's the will of God, it's going to happen. If God says it, it's going to happen. I'm sorry, but that's not Bible. That is not Bible. If God ever reveals his will to you, what he's trying to say to you is that's his desire. That's what he wants. Because like any father, he wants what's best for his children. And so he, he directs you. He gives you a picture an understanding, this is the will. This is my will for your life. But he never forces you there. How many understand that it was never God's will that Israel had a king? Never. He wanted them to be a kingdom of priests. But finally he said to Samuel, go ahead and give them a king. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. And you know what's so amazing? He even chose those kings. And there were some great kings. And we got a lot of good preaching material from those kings and those scriptures that teach us about them. But the truth was it was never God's will. Never. Never. The Bible says God wills all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's the will of God for every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. God wills all to be saved. Why aren't all men saved? It's the will of God. It's the will of God. 
You know why? One word, decisions. And those of you that want to write something profound, here it is. Your destiny is not determined by God's will, but it's determined by the decisions you make. Choose right, good things happen. God said, I set before you two roads. There's a blessing and there's a curse. You choose. Come on, lift your hands. You're, you're really quiet on me, but I really believe you're listening. Come on, lift your hands to the Lord. We open your spirit here today. See, because what's happening, I don't even have to get through the message. Some of you are already feeling conviction. You're already feeling because you know you have backed up from some of the things that at one time you felt very strong about, that God dealt with you about, but no longer anymore. And because you still talk in tongues, because you still come in here and feel the presence of the Lord, you think it's okay. Let me tell you something. Don't ever think God's silence is permission. Don't ever think that just because he doesn't chop your head off and bring some terrible judgment or wrath against you that he's saying everything is okay. No, 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 no. He is wanting his church to perfect holiness in, his, in the fear of God. I'm going to measure everything I do, everywhere I go, every way I look, everything I am how I talk, what my associations are going to be. I'm going to measure it through the mirror of God's Word. That's what it means when it says we work out our own salvation in fear and trembling. It's not saying we have the right to set up a new doctrine and if we don't want to do it, it doesn't matter. That's not what he's saying. We look into the mirror of this book and there's some things I got to work out because there's some principles in here that I can't violate. Holiness is a principle. It's, it's what God is. It's what he is. It's two things. There's many attributes of God, but there's two things. The Bible says God is. God is holy. And God is love. And the more you love him, the more you'll desire to be holy. The less you love him, the more distant your relationship is, the more other voices can come in and feed and talk and speak into your mind and tell you it's okay. I understood that Sunday what Pastor Foster was feeling as he was preaching, and it, it is the same feeling of responsibility and the weight of responsibility I feel this afternoon. Got all... As, as Pastor Foster was, was speaking, I'm going back to two Sundays ago now. As he was speaking, I, I mentioned, I think, Wednesday, this past Monday, a week ago, past Monday, was my 40th anniversary. I was called to preach 40 years ago. And all I could think about was 40 years of stories, true stories, of people who would not heed the warnings of the consequences of sin and the direction they were going. And I tell you, if I think much about some of them, I could easily break into tears. Tragic, tragic stories, tragic stories. But God also reminded me, however, of some true stories whose lives and the destiny of their lives and families were redirected because they did listen. Because it didn't have to be the way it was going. And they were able to make a change. They heeded the preaching of the word. They heeded godly counsel. They realized the conviction and the tug that God was placing on their heart. And they made some drastic changes. And I use the word drastic intentionally because I'm telling you, sometimes we're afraid of drastic changes. But sometimes it takes drastic changes to get us set in the right course.
<laughs> because of those right changes, their lives, their children's lives that should have and would have been destroyed have been saved and spared a multitude of heartache and shame. There are men in this room today that if you had followed the course that your father had, I had to look at my stepdad one day. My real dad died when I was five years old. And when he died, my dad was a converted Jew and was a powerful preacher and man of God. He was actually converted through hearing a man speak in tongues in perfect Hebrew. Walked into a little church service believing Jesus was a curse word. Walked out of that church service believing he was the one true God of the Bible. Baptized in Jesus' name. Filled with the Holy Ghost. But my dad died when I was five years old. And so, so I, 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 there was a tremendous heritage that I missed. My mother, unfortunately, she ignored the, the, the advice of my pastor. She, she had four children and she was, she was concerned about taking care of them. And, and, but the man that was set, set his eyes on her was not living for God. Wanted nothing to do with God, quite frankly, and he still doesn't. My pastor begged her, don't, don't do this. You, you don't want to do this. You don't want to do this. But she was convinced it was okay. I want to tell you, my family has reaped major consequence because of that one mistake. And I remember the last few years of my mother's life, I never had a conversation with her that she didn't break down weeping because of her lost children and her lost grandchildren. I stand here today by the grace and mercy of God. And I remember having to say to my stepfather one day, Pop, I love you, but if I would have followed your example, I would not be living for God. God only knows where our children would be today, where our family would be today. If I would even have a marriage today, God only knows. And I tell you in the Holy Ghost today, and I could walk back to some of you right now, you're looking in the wrong direction. And if you don't make an adjustment... Your future is in trouble. I don't say that feeling good. I say that in seriousness here today. Come on, will you lift your hands with me one more time? Can we pray? In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I know it's getting late and I'm going to hurry and hasten because this altar is going to open up here in a moment and the floodgate is going to pour out and people's going to be touched in a very special way. Ezekiel had a visitation from God. He was, he was allowed to see the visible manifestations of God's glory. He saw the glory of God come into the house or the temple by way of the east gate. The Spirit of the Lord then took Ezekiel into the inner court of the temple. And I want to read it just as God said it through the words of Ezekiel. Go to chapter 40, 43 again, verse number 7. And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever and my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile 
neither they nor their kings by their whoredom, by their, nor by their carcasses of their kings and in their high places, in their setting of their threshold by my thresholds, in their post by my post, in the wall between me and them, and they have even defiled my holy name by their abominations that they have committed. Wherefore, I have consumed them in my anger. Now let them put away their whoredoms and the carcasses of their kings far from me, and I will dwell in the midst of them forever. Hear me, please. You will not ever have God's glory without holiness. Never. The two cannot be separated. Verse 10. Thou son of man, show the house. Here's what he's saying. Show the house to the house of Israel. That they may be ashamed of their iniquities. What he's saying is, compare. I want you to show them. Let them see my house, how it's supposed to be. And let them see it the way they're defiling it. Let them measure the pattern. He says, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities. And let them measure the pattern. And if they be ashamed of all that they have done... Show them the form of the house and the fashion thereof. In other words, show them that which is real. The fashion thereof and the goings out thereof and the comings in thereof and all the forms thereof and all the ordinance thereof and all the forms thereof and all the laws thereof and write it in their sight that they may keep the whole form thereof and all the orders thereof and do them. You know what he's saying? Ellis paraphrase. Warn them so that they will be ashamed of their sin and repent. The word repentance isn't a one moment event. The word repentance is is an about face. It's a change of one's mind. It's something you do every morning. You wake up with a willingness. I want to perfect holiness today. I want to please God today. Lord, if there's anything I'm planning that doesn't please you, let me know. I repent. If I'm going that way, I'm going to walk another way. I'm going to make it up in my mind that today, whatever your will is, I want to follow your will. It's something we measure every day of our lives. Warn them, God said, so they will be ashamed of their sin and repent. Show them what the house is supposed to look like so that they understand clearly and will do what they know to do. That's Ella's paraphrase, but that's what he's saying. In verse 12, here's the reason. This is the law of the house. Upon the top of the mountain and the whole limit thereof round about shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. Holiness is the law of God's house. It's not a set of rules. It's not a set of regulations. Holiness is the very nature and character of God. And here's what Peter said in 2 Peter 1 and 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust don't you understand what dwells in us is the very nature of a holy God and that nature of God that dwells in us is to lead us from those things that would corrupt us that would ruin us that would destroy us God is holy. As sons and daughters of God, it must become our nature. It's how we measure right and wrong. It's how we measure good from bad. It's how we measure that which is evil from that which is holy. We don't measure others who do not know Jesus through the eyes of judgment and condescension. However, we do measure our own lives. Why? Because we're his sons. We're we're, we're sons and daughters. We've become partakers of his divine nature. Dwelling in us is a holy 
spirit. We have the privilege every day of our lives to sit together with him in heavenly places. Every morning we are privileged to enter into the holiest of holies with boldness and find forgiveness and find mercy and find direction. David said it this way, Psalm 24, 3. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from our God, the salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek his face. O oh, Jacob, Selah. Matthew 5 and 8, blessed are the pure in heart. The pure in heart, for they shall see God. When your heart's pure, you're not looking at other people. When your heart's pure, you're looking at him. When your heart's pure and you have a calamity, you're not trying to blame it on somebody or something. When your heart's pure, you say, okay, Jesus, what can I learn from this? Hebrews Paul wrote to the Hebrew church, chapter 10, verse 22, let us draw near with a, true, with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from all evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Two chapters later, Paul quoted the psalmist David. Hebrews 12 and 14 Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. He's actually quoting Psalms 24. Who shall stand the hill of the Lord? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Follow peace with all men. Here's what you need to understand. The word holiness there. Look it up in the Greek. It's the Greek word that means purity. You know what Paul's saying? When your heart's not right with your brother, it's not right. And without purity, no man shall see the Lord. Peter wrote, 1 Peter chapter 13, chapter 1, verse 13. Anybody mind me reading the Bible? Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end of, for the grace that is brought unto you. How? By the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you're struggling living holy, you just need a revelation of Jesus. Your view of Jesus is not pure. You, 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 you're seeing him in a, in, a, in a wrong light. But as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust of your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, lifestyle, conduct, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Verse 22, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit, with unfeigned or without hypocrisy, love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Hear me, please, and I'm, I'm, I'm closing. I'm done. I didn't set the law of God's house. Pastor Lashley didn't set the law of God's house. Bishop didn't set the law of God's house. God set the law for his own house. Both for the physical building, both for the spiritual building. If the Pentecostals, hear me now, if the Pentecostals of Peoria ever expect to see God's glory manifested in this city through your ministry, holiness must continue to be the law that governs God's house.
not this building, but this living, breathing house called his church. It will always be the law of the house. It will always be the law of the house. It will always be, uh, I got two amens. It will always be the law of the house. I want to say it again. Without holiness, there will be no glory. The spiritual authority that needs to be released in this city will not be released without holiness. It won't be. It won't be. What a great, precious promises that God has given. What great promises God has spoken prophetically to this church. And he gives us the grace, the ability to pursue him. And to be something we could never be within ourselves. Do you know that? That's what's so powerful about holiness. I, I, I feel sorry for people that have been taught a cheap grace. See, there's a cheap grace out there. Well... Grace is God's unmerited favor. Can't be earned. Nothing you can do to acquire it. You don't work for it. You don't buy it. Nothing you can do. So don't, don't bother with it. Doesn't, doesn't matter. Just go ahead, talk with tongues, and live like an animal. Just talk in tongues, but just let the world in all of its... Sickness. Just begin to control our lives. Paul said it like this, I beseech you therefore, brethren. It was the strongest appeal he could give. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed or fashioned to this world, but be you transformed, be a metamorpho, completely, radically changed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Oh, you got to be careful. Those Pentecostals will brainwash you. That apostolic church, they will brainwash you. You're right. See, I knew. No, no, you're right. You're right. We need our brains washed. We need our brains washed. And that's why... Grace is such a powerful gift from God. Do you know what? You want to know the true definition of grace? It's more than just this unearned favor. It's a divine empowering. In other words, God gives you the ability to do, to be what you could not be. That we have become the sons of God. And he's saying, hey, because I'm holy, come on, give me your hand. By my grace, I'm going to enable you to become something you could never be by yourself. <laughs> Holiness is not a bad word. It's one of the greatest gifts God has ever given to us. Kilamayedobokoshataya. <laughs> In the name of Jesus. Come on, stand with me. This local church has a rich history of the miraculous. It has not been by accident. And it's not been because you've been perfect. You know what? Can we just hold the music? You, you do awesome. 
just hold the music right now. It's not because you've been perfect, because Bishop has been perfect, because these men up here are perfect, because I've been perfect. Hey, listen, there's one thing we all have in common. If we got this is what we deserve, we would be dead a long time ago. So we don't stand here because we deserve it. We don't stand here preaching. I'm not preaching to you like this because I'm this great example of holiness. I'm telling you, but there is something on the inside of me. Pastor, I want to perfect holiness in my life. I've told my wife this. I want our grandchildren to see the same pappy that their sons, that our sons and daughters saw when they come to our home. I don't want them to see anything different than their kids saw, than their parents saw. I don't want to do anything to put up any kind of stumbling block that would open a door to them to become something that I would never want them to be. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. This church, because this church, if you're a guest here today, welcome. If you have any struggles with what I've been preaching, go to pastor. He'll give you all the answers. It's not here by accident. This church was built on an apostolic foundation and principles and doctrinal truth, which includes a lifestyle of holiness. Hear me, please. Regardless of what the world says or does, your passion to live holy before God must never change. And if you're new to this thing, take 2 Corinthians 6 to your prayer closet and ask God what it means to perfect holiness. Ask him what it means, all filthiness of flesh and spirit. Ask him what that means and watch him as he begins to open your understanding. And pastor won't have to stand and say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. He'll say, you know what, pastor? God just dealt with me about something. I never saw this before. I never, never understood this before. That's okay. Again, I'm not sitting here giving you rules. I'm not here preaching any rules. I'm not here to try to set up any type of standard for you. I'm just telling you there's a principle called holiness and it first resides in the heart. If you don't have it in your heart, you'll never have it anywhere else. Holiness is an attitude of the heart. <laughs> And so I want to say it again as a warning, as a warning to these leaders, as a warning to you. No holiness, no glory. Has nothing to do with his love. But his house is holy. You know, I I stressed as I close, I stressed the stories of 40 years, people who have walked from holiness. But let me tell you some other stories, true stories, over the past 40 years that we've personally witnessed. Drug addicts who were delivered and are addicted no more. Alcoholics who have been delivered and are addicted no more. Nicotine addicts freed and are addicted no more. The demon possessed who are now delivered and bound no more. Perversion and pornography addictions broken and are addicted no more. Marriages that were broken now restored and broken no more. Out of work and homeless, but now are working and they're homeless no more. Prostitutes who are feeling, who would, who would freely sell their bodies. But guess what? They're not selling their bodies anymore. No more. 
talking about stories I've personally witnessed. Not to mention the numbers of healings and miracles. Oh, God, help us see God's glory manifested. First in our lives, in our marriages, in our homes. Every time we gather in his name. Oh God, we want your glory. You know what it is? It's his, it's his divine presence revealed. It's, his, it's, it's who he is. It's his essence. Revealed and manifested. How many want his glory? I want his glory. I want his glory to flow through my hands. I want his glory to flow out of my voice. I want his glory to flow through every aspect of my life. I want people to say, hey, there's something different about here. There's something different. You know, we've been to a lot of churches, but there's something different here. I want to tell you, if they don't walk in this place and experience something different, something's wrong. If they don't walk in your home and experience something different, something's wrong. If they don't notice you in your school, in your university, at your job, in your factory, if they don't notice something different about you, something's wrong. It could be that you've walked back from some things that you once held dear. The altar call is very simple this afternoon. It's a fresh commitment to walk in obedience to your revelation and to rededicate and reconsecrate yourself to a lifestyle of holiness and everything that means holiness in your homes. It all starts there. Holiness in your attitude. Holiness in your hearts. Holiness in your conduct. Holiness in your entertainment. And yes, even holiness in how, even holiness in how you dress. Because all excludes nothing. When every head bowed and every eye closed in this house. It's a time of self-inspection. See, I already know because the Lord has already told me that there are people in this room who are not living what you know. Because things have become so normal today. And after all, it's not 1950 anymore, Bishop. And again, I'm I'm not saying what that may be. It may be as simple as something God dealt with you 20 years ago that you laid on an altar, but you have since picked it back up. Something you laid down five years ago. But for whatever reason, you felt like that, you know what? Maybe it's really not that big of a deal. And after all, there's no real scripture and verse that says thou shalt not. Yes, there was a young man called a rich young ruler who wanted to be a disciple of Jesus. Jesus said, you know, there's just one issue you got. You need to go get rid of everything you've got. Come follow me. And the man walked away sorrowfully. You see, if he'd have been apostolic today, like us, he would have said, Jesus... Show me that in the book. Show me where it ever says that has to be done in the Bible. And he 
640 laws of the Old Testament. You can't find it. See, there could be some things God deals with you about that he deals with nobody else about just simply because he knows it's a weight in your life. Not a sin even, just a weight, just something that is keeping you from being who you're supposed to be. And I'm appealing to you as a church, don't you dare pressure this pastor into relaxing one bit on keeping holiness as the law of this house. And so this, I've asked for no music because I just want to make this altar open today. I'm not going to name anything and I'm not going to come back to somebody unless God would direct me to. But I just wonder as a collective body. And if you're a guest here today and you're looking at this place as possibly your church, that we could come to this altar and either rededicate or dedicate, whatever the case may be, reconsecrate or consecrate for the very first time to a life and a lifestyle of holiness. Because holiness is the law of God's house. This altar's open. You talk to the Lord however you want to talk to him. I know God's already been talking to some of you. I know. In Jesus' name, if you want to stand... If you want to kneel, could it be that there are some wounded people in here today? And God's been trying.